I'm racially mixed. I was uh, put up for adoption at birth, and they're both white. They don't speak Spanish at all, and what I've noticed is since I look Mexican, a lot of uh, Hispanic people expect me to speak Spanish or fit in with the culture somehow, and I don't. Hey, what's up? This is John with the Dr. John Deloney Show. So glad that you are with us talking about mental health and parenting and relationships and marriage and kids and school, whatever you got going on. We'll talk about your pets if that would help. Uh, I'm not great. What are you, what are you waving? Quit questions for humans? I thought yeah. you were flipping me off. That's what I- you, you are not good at like subtlety and like hints and like, hey, don't forget we have to do this and I hold it up. I'm not good at subtlety. But that's not shocking. It's not. My wife tells me that like it's like been an embarrassing thing for 20 years. Like you're like the one where you know like the, I can see Sheila's trying to kick you under the table and you're like why are you kicking me? Yes. Or like hey, you don't need to be around this person cuz they want to date you and I'm like what are you talking about? You're in, yeah, I the most clueless. Yeah. I don't have to I don't have a lot of friends. It's cool. But we love you. Oh, do we? Do you? We do. Oh. Um like a labrador. Okay, so hey, <laughs> if you want to be on the show and clearly it's 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 one of the best um as seen by how we're launching this this morning give me a buzz dude 184 1844 <laughs> 1844-693-3291 1844-693-3291 we have a a packed house out there today packed packed we got three awesome folks one dude on his phone good to see you man Maybe you're texting. You're texting me. I'll, I'll holler back at you. All right. So we're doing questions for humans. Yes, because oh, it's, it's a ten dollars sale. sale. It's the May ten dollars sale, mm-hmm. and all of the questions for humans are ten dollars. So we're gonna. You do know one. how much they ask me before they put all of my stuff on sale? Not Never. once. It's cool though. It's cool. All right. So go for it. All right. So I didn't pref- preface anyone with this question. So Preface. I this was a- Lord, help me. All right. How old do you feel like you really are and why? That's a great question. Go first, Jenna. Why is it always me first? Um, I feel maybe like 30. I feel like sometimes I feel like I'm like more mature, wiser. Like I have to be like the mother of a group in my friends. So I always feel like I'm like, even though I'm typically the youngest one in my friend group, I, t- I generally feel like I'm the older one. And I was going to say, cause you're always like singing Taylor Swift as you skip down the halls that you're like 13. Yes. That's exactly me. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Although I do love me some T Swift, but I don't tend to skip down the halls. Although true. I can, if you want. You're not a hall skipper. Ben, what do you say? It's a, it's a little bit of a two part emotionally, I feel like 22. Okay. Physically, I feel like 40. <laughs> was- My bones creak all the time. <laughs> knees, joints pop all the time. Yeah, but like, but just, I throw down at a hardcore show. Like, that you saw does the not other day. get better as you get older. Yeah. Just heads up. All right, what do you say, Kelly? Um, I would say I feel like closer to late 30s, early 40s. Mm-hmm. And I'm about to be 49. And because God, I, you're old. Go he's ahead. Two years older than me, people. Go Three ahead. years. Um, because I feel, I keep feeling like there's got to be other people that are more adult than me. Like I can't be the adult. <laughs> yeah. And especially now, like since my mom passed, we have none of our aunts and uncles on that side of the family. So we cousins are the old ones. Are you know we're the oldest now? We're like, wait, us? Oh crap! We're I, in I think that's the great secret to adulthood when you realize that all of the people that you thought had it together were making it up. Had too. nothing. Yeah, it's clear. Like my parents, I had no clue what they were doing. No, making it up. Yeah, making which it up makes you feel better. But yeah, I keep. I still feel like there's got to be somebody that's more of an adult than me. See, I am trapped between. I, <laughs> based on some text messages messages I sent this morning, my humor locked in at about fourteen and just stopped. It just parked there. And kind of like you're talking, James, like the other night after hardcore show, like I'm James, sorry, Ben, uh, the other day after that show, my body was like, we're getting pretty old for the old mosh pits. I remember being a kid in the pit being like, who's that old guy? And it occurred to me the other night. Oh, that's me now. It's you now. I'm that guy. I wasn't wearing like a suit jacket though, but, but yeah. I, um, yeah. I think 14 and, uh, 45, just like, uh, Jennifer, what's the movie? 
Who is the woman who played Alias? 13 going on 30. Oh, yeah. Um, Jennifer Garner. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I kind of feel like that. So there you go. Questions for humans. Oh, Nate Dog. Uh, I feel like I'm in my mid to late 30s. I'm actually 32, but I feel older because I have four children that sap most energy I could ever possibly accumulate <laughs> ever. <laughs> That's the saddest answer. <laughs> I just feel like I'm dying. Way to bring the room down, Nathan. Hi, I'm, I'm the father of four. This is it. It's true. <laughs> it's true. Awesome. All right, question for humans. Let's go out to uh, James in H-Town. What's up, James? Hey, Dr. John. Thanks for taking my call. I really appreciate it. Of course, man. What's up? Hey, so first things first, go Astros. Have oh. to get that in there. Yeah, dude. They're, they are not going very fast right now. No, but there's a lot of games, so we're good. Spoken like a true Astro fan. Okay, there's a lot of games hey. ahead. So what's up? Hey, so uh relationship question for you. Um I'll just get right to it and then give you a few bullet points. So how do I set boundaries with my brother-in-law who is getting a divorce from my sister that'll keep me healthy emotionally? Did he leave so, your sister? Uh, is he leaving your sister? Uh, I mean, that's kind of getting, I mean, he's the one that filed, but I mean, there's always more to it, you know? So what's what, tell me um, the more to it. So, um, their relationship or what I'm calling about. Yeah. What you're calling about. Okay. So I'll give you a few bullet points. So in, uh, January they filed for divorce. And so just kind of out of respect for them, I, uh, didn't talk to them much. Um, I mean, there's attorneys involved and just to support my sister a hundred percent and just out of respect. So, um, like I said, didn't talk with him much until last week. Um, he sent me some texts kind of emotionally charged and I had abandoned him and he didn't know what I was getting at by not talking to him and just sort of guilt tripping me a little bit. So I responded and eventually I just said, Hey, let's just meet up for lunch and talk about it. Thank so, you for being the adult in the room. No, well, I mean, I kind of gave in for a few texts, but eventually I mean, that's I like super it, Dawson's I, Creek, Alvaro Levine, like, you're not my friend anymore. I'm sending a mean text. <laughs> it's like, bro, you're, we're adults, man. Just like, let's meet right. up. But good for you. Okay. Yeah. I'd, yeah. I, how'd I the mean, lunch go? It was good. It was good. Um, it was productive. I told him, hey, nothing's out of spite. I just, I got to support my sis. You know, she's, mm -hmm. um, I mean, her husband's leaving her. Dad's not really in the picture. I'm the only brother. So I just want to be there for however I can. Was he a mature and, adult and, and, and hear that out? Yes. Yeah, he actually did. It's not what he wanted to hear. Yeah. Um, but he said, hey, okay, I mean, that hurts, but I'm going to follow your lead moving forward. So I said, hey, I can't give you a time frame, and I know it's unfair, but I'm treading unfamiliar waters here. Yeah. You know? I, I don't think there's anything unfair about it, to be honest with you. Um. I know that, that marriages go two ways. Well, I know marriages go two ways. There's always two sides to a story. And sometimes the person who finally just calls it um, is the bad guy, right? Um, and so it, he may not be the bad guy here. It may just be who knows what's going on. But at the end of the day, you get to decide who you're, you are in relationship with. And similar, if you had called and said, hey, this is like one of my closest friends in the world. We, we've, we're, our, our, our families play together. We, we are, go out all the time. And I'm not going to lose my friendship just because him and my sister didn't work out. And my sister's having a bad attitude about it. I would tell you she didn't get a vote either. What you need to know is whatever you decide is going to come with a cost and just be okay with that. And I say be okay with it. It's, it's not like it's going to be fun. But at the end of the day, um, be okay with it. I know some folks who have um, filed for divorce. And they imagine the other side of divorce as though everything in their life is the same. They just removed the one um, puzzle piece that was their husband or wife and then just replaced it with somebody who's more fun and cool and prettier and younger or whatever. But they think that their friends are going to stay the same. Their, their 
living arrangements are going to stay the same. And so the, I, it's, it never ceases to amaze me how surprised people are that when you file for divorce, when you marriage, when your marriage breaks up, when you choose to call it on your marriage, it affects everything. It blows up your friendship circles. It blows up where you hang out. It usually affects your living arrangement, your income. It blows up everything. And so, um, he's going to want to try to hang on to every bit of this is the way my life used to be and not take full accountability for it. No, dude, everything you know about your former life is over now and you're going to have to figure out what comes next. See what I'm saying? And that's not your, that's not your responsibility to carry. The, uh, the other side of this is this, has your sister said, I don't want you talking to him. I don't want you meeting with him. I don't want him in, in your life. No, no, she, she knows we're all going to have to figure out our, relationship with him moving forward. And so why'd you choose this? And you, why'd you, why is your solution? I got to cut him out. Well, I mean, it's not cut out completely. I mean, I, uh, I, I just don't want to say something that might be used for, I don't know, maybe the attorneys or something like that. And, and to be honest with you, it was kind of taxing emotionally to see him, you know, break down while I was talking to him. And then, talk to my sister and see her break down. And I just feel like being in the middle of it is, it brings me down, you know? Yeah, and, dude, uh, but hey, hold on, hold on, hold on, man. You're in a relationship with these people. This is your sister and your best friend. Like, this is what, this is what we do when we have family members and best friends. We get in the mud with them. Like, if, if you only want to be around, have friends and family members, unless they're not bumming me out, bro, dude, that makes you not a great friend and not a great brother or sister. Like, it, of course, it's going to bring you down. And that's why you're there. Like, that that's the role you play in this season is sitting with people in their grief. The picture they had for their life is, is exploded. It's gone. And that's what friends and community does. And so I, I, I guess I would challenge you, man, um, to not see this like, man, it's just kind of bumming me out, bro. Like, I, I just, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't identify with that I, attitude at all. I want to be there for my friends when they're hurting bad. I got you. And I get um, you not wanting to say something dumb. Hopefully you're, you trust yourself enough to not do that. Maybe you don't, maybe you don't, but what do you think you're going to say? Um, I don't know. Maybe something that my sister has told me that he doesn't know about or I don't know. It, like I said, this is unfamiliar to me. Um, uh, so one, one important thing we've, let me tell you a couple of things that guide my life, okay? Maybe this helps. Number one, especially in this situation, I don't keep secrets. I'm out. I don't keep secrets. So if someone's like, hey, I need to tell you this, but you can't tell, nope, I'm out. I don't want to hear that. That's for you and your attorney. Um, I'm, not, I'm not the person. When the smoke clears and all this, we can talk. But right now, it's not smart. The, um, the second part is my buddies know, my closest friends in the world know, if they leave their wives. I'll love them. I will, I will love them to the end of time, but their wife is welcome at my house. They can come stay with me. Now they don't have to. And if they don't want to, then my buddies can come stay too, but I'm not going to just go to war against their spouse because they, they chose to make decisions because their spouse is, is one of my close friends too. And I'm talking about my core, my core group of people. Um, and so I think you can do both. But also, I'm not worried about accidentally saying something that I shouldn't be saying. Or I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a pretty good vault of a friend. And so I'm not worried about saying this or saying that. Like, uh, just, it sounds like at the end of the day, brother, it, there's, you need to be confident in your emotional maturity. And maybe this is the first big heavy thing that you've experienced with your friends and your family. But unfortunately, dude, this is the rest of your life. Marriages are going to blow up. Your friends are going to do stupid stuff. Your friends are going to go to jail. They're going to get fired from their job. Someone's going to pass away. This is the future. And so being able to handle that in a dignified way that honors people's confidentiality, that doesn't just write people and cut people out, um, that doesn't just like you go hide because, man, you're making me feel bad because you're sad. Of course, that's that's when friends go in. That's when friends go in, when the, when the building's on fire. Um, whew. That was tough, man, but I want you to reconsider your role in their lives. They've been leaning on you. Y'all been together for seasons just like this. Seasons just like this. And if you can't do it, at least, yeah, 
Good for you. You know enough about yourself to know I can't do that, but my hope is you can head into the storm instead of running away from it. Thanks for the call, brother. We'll be right back. Hey, Deloney here. Folks, getting out of debt and getting good sleep have something in common, intentionality. When you're working your way out of debt, you have to be purposeful. You got to build your emergency fund, pay off your debt smallest to largest and stick with it, all that stuff. And when you're ready to invest in good sleep, you have to have a plan too. You got to get that early morning sunlight. You got to exercise. You got to cut out all this caffeine and you got to limit screen time. And you have to budget for a premium quality mattress because it makes an enormous difference. And that's why I recommend DreamCloud mattresses. And for my friends on a budget, I have incredible news. Right now, DreamCloud is offering my listeners 25% off their order plus $50 in additional savings. And why not? $599 more in accessories with promo code John Deloney. That's pillows, luxury sheets, and a mattress protector. And DreamCloud gives you a one-year in-home trial so you can make sure it's the right fit. So it's time to invest in good sleep. Have a budget meeting with your spouse, make a plan, and then go to dreamcloudsleep.com and use code John Deloney to get your new mattress today. That's dreamcloudsleep.com and use code John Deloney. All right, we are back. Let's go to Ashley in San Clemente, California. What's up, Ashley? Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Doing all right. All right, so what's up? You. Um, I'm wondering how I can better connect with women after being raised by a narcissistic mother. And now I have two boys and I'm in a new community and just I'm finding it really hard to maintain friendships with women. It just seems as if it's not going anywhere. I'm just really happy-go-lucky, and it seems as if people are just getting bored of me, and I can't keep friendships with people. Why do you think that? Give me some evidence that that's true, that people that you are happy-go-lucky and they just get bored of you and walk away. People seem happy to keep talking to me, keeping up an acquaintanceship of sorts, but after a while of meeting up with our kids and whatnot, it just dies out. And it seems as if that's the case with a lot of friendships that I have made here so far. Mm. And I start to think it's not them, it's me. It's And I... I, I don't know. That's fair. I that's fair. Have, that's, I mean, that's, yeah. that's fair. Have you tried having people over in your home? I have. It hasn't it hasn't worked yeah. out. Tell me about it. Yeah, it's it's worked out. People are really happy. We have a huge yard. The kids, all the kids, come over, mm-hmm. and yeah, people. All, the kids enjoy it. Our kids play well. Um, you know, I can keep a conversation going. I we're having a good time, but then it just seems as if maybe they connect with the other moms more, or and they go off and do their own thing at some point, and I'm just waiting to see if they're going to call or they're going to text or yeah i i mean another example is i'm a part of this support group at a farm um, for parents and all the children are there too and i do have a friend there and she tried to be vulnerable with me and i just i can't get myself to be comfortable enough to say more than i'm here for you i'm sorry you're going through this that's really tough and then she went on to express this her situation at the support group. And I just watched all these women gather around her and they're just saying really honest and beautiful things that things that I feel like I had wanted to tell her, but I just my body just feels I know you talk about this a lot, just your body just my body just really feels unsafe yeah. being vulnerable with people. So because can I can I tell you you're, you're you're right there on the edge of yeah. this whole thing turning around for you. What you just I said know, but- is really powerful. Hold on, I want you to know how far you come. You're talking years of counseling and therapy to get to right where you said right where you just articulated. The words are in your heart. The words are on your tongue. You're ready to, and your body freezes up on you because when you're a kid. 
that level of vulnerability got you hurt. Right? Yeah. And my guess yeah. is there's probably other romantic relationships that have cycled through that as well. Fair? Um, not exactly because I, you know, I, I was the person to leave people before I could be vulnerable with them. That's what I mean. That's what I'm talking about. The cycle, like this whole cycle oh, sure. created. Yeah. So yeah. all I have to say is this, you're at a precipice and you get to choose what comes next. And the, the, the I guess you just don't know how to do that. You got to jump. You got to jump. I wish there was another way around it. The, 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 the old DBT pathway is there's a negative thought or a negative trigger. And it's all these women crowd. It's, it's a friend of yours who's weeping, right? And it automatically free, freezes your body up. And maybe it's because yeah. when mom would start crying, you knew, oh God, here we go. She's going to drag me underwater and make me feel this way and that way, whatever. And that leads to negative emotions. I feel this thing. And then I, I act. And sometimes the negative action is don't act. Sometimes it's run and grab a drink. Sometimes it's go run and grab a, a, a donut. Sometimes it's freeze. I do nothing. Yeah. I let my friend just stand out there in the cold. And then yeah. the fourth, and I think this can be the worst part of it all, is the negative emotions you internalize after whatever action you do or don't do. Yeah. And then you yeah, beat I yourself just, up about it and the whole loop starts over again. Right? Yeah, that's what this past two weeks I've been like, I just left afterwards for mm -hmm. supposed to coffee. I just left and packed my kids up and went in the car and just thought I shouldn't even like half friends. I like, I don't want to be, I mean, just this is extreme, but you know, I was just reverting to my child self and I just thought I don't even want to be alive. I just, I don't know why people need me in their lives or why I'm here or, and it's so extreme, but I just felt that lonely child self come back in full force and, and just started blaming myself because I'm an adult now and I have kids and mm -hmm just feels like I shouldn't be doing this anymore. I but don't have to run away, but I am. And it just feels so, immature and stupid. So do, and do, you, do you want to be sorry. different? I, but that, I, that, I listen, do. listen, listen hold, on, whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on. The way you're talking to yourself, that's your mom's <laughs> words coming out of your mouth at that seven-year-old little girl. Stop. Yeah. Don't let your mom keep talking into your life. Yeah. Okay. She yeah. didn't get a voice anymore. And I know that's easy to say in a short phone call. What this will mean is several months of you catching that voice every single solitary time you hear it. Every time. I'm in the middle of this right now. And I'm telling you, it is the worst. Every time I have a negative thought, negative self-talk, and I am ruthless with myself. Mm -hmm. Um. And I, I thought I could hide it on the show and enough people called it out and then sitting with a counselor, like it's bad. It's not good. And catching it every single time and challenging it. What I'm telling you already in my life is it's already starting to fade. It's already starting to fade. Here's what I want you to articulate for me. What is stopping you from reaching out to her and saying, Hey, you had a moment of vulnerability and I froze. I'm so glad all those other women were there, but I want to circle back and check in with you. How are you doing now? What's stopping you from that, fo that phone call, that conversation, that cup of coffee? Because I, th I, 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 mean, I think you're that close to developing a deep, deep friendship with somebody. I mean, I'm about to do that, um, but... You promise I, you'll do that for the I, day's I, over? I will. Okay. I'm just really scared of how that conversation is going to go yes, fair. afterwards. And if I'm going to be rejected or if she's just going to play it off and say like, oh, totally fine now. Do you think, do you think she even, even noticed? That I left or that I didn't respond? Or Both. 
My guess is she didn't even know. notice. I don't think she did. Okay. When you are surrounded or raised or work for a narcissist, you, you put your head on a swivel 24-7, 365, because you never know where it's going to come from. You, we know bad okay. guys are going to try to hurt us, and we know that uh, fire will burn us. But when somebody who's reportedly loves us hurts us, right? It comes from, it comes from all angles. And so mm -hmm. I, you're so hyper aware. I would bet beyond anything um, that she, she certainly doesn't feel the same way you do about it. She's not sitting at home right now being like, oh my gosh, Ashley failed me. She screwed up so bad and then she just ran away. I almost guarantee you she's not doing that. Okay. And here's the thing. A hundred percent of relationships are a risk. All of them. Yeah. I've been married for 20 years and we dated five years before that. Every day is a risk. Mm -hmm. Starting a new friendship is a risk. What does that mean? She could say, yeah, I'm good, man. Are you going to come over for coffee? No, I'm good. I don't want to hang out. And by the way, if she says that, she may have diarrhea. It may not, yeah. She may not be saying no because she doesn't like you and you're some weirdo. And so maybe the second or third time she says no. And then, okay, I get the message. This hurts. I'm going to be sad about yeah. it. And then I'm going to go okay. on. Mm -hmm. I, in, in, let me answer your, a question you asked earlier. I think you have the opportunity to be such a powerful gift to your kids and to other women in your life. What you're hiding behind the garage door is so uh, important for people. So important. Well, thanks for saying that. I'm not. I'm not just making it up. Because you've seen people who are supposed to love you hurt people. All of us have, but most of us don't have a vocabulary, a language, a relationship to talk about that in. You've got that. It's a gift. You can share that. guess so. I just... No, don't yeah. guess so. It is. It <laughs> okay, is. Okay. <laughs> Listen, yeah. I, um, I'm terrified of heights with all of my life. Like, for, for my whole life. I don't like getting on ladders. I don't like... Uh, I, I don't like... I, I just hate it. I hate the heights. And then my buddy, my boss, peer pressured us all into going skydiving. And there's like, no way I'm doing this. And then a couple of my colleagues instantly said, no, I'm not doing it. And I was like, well, then for sure I'm doing it then because I'm still a middle schooler when it comes to peer pressure. And so I went and I got all, and the guy who I was tethered to, some big old tatted up smoke show, former Navy oh, SEAL God. guy. And he looked at me and said, you're going to try to fight me as we go out the door. We're going <laughs> out that door. The easier you want to make this, the better. And then he said these words, you just got to jump. And then... I did. And I want to tell you, it was transcendent. It was, just, it was uh, just to not get too cheesy, it was a spiritual moment. The whole world slowed down. Mm -hmm. Right? When yeah. It, when it comes, you are right there. You know your body's responding. You know how nervous you get. You know how comfortable you get. You got to jump. And then when you go, you got to feel it. And I know you will, but be cognizant of it. Right? This is a trigger for me. It's creating negative emotions, which makes me act a certain way, or it doesn't make me, but it propels me into a different kind of action. And then I feel bad about the way I just acted. It just goes on a circle, on a circle, on a circle. And any one of those points, you can jump in there and stop that cycle. It's awesome. My body's feeling bad. It shouldn't feel that way. Yes, it should. It should. So my mom sucked. My mom was really not a great person and, and goofed me up from the get-go. Now my body's doing what it should be, but I really want friends. And this woman's hurting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean in. That's how we go, man. We break that cycle. And we're going to do it over and over and over and over because that cycle is super entrenched. And your kids are going to get to watch their mom breathe for the first time in a long time. I was talking to somebody the other day who's struggling in their marriage and they track all their sleep and everything. And she was telling me that when her and her husband have, have been reconnecting, not sexually, just reconnecting, just like hanging out, laughing, talking, uh, telling story, whatever, just reconnecting. Um, that all of her metrics are better. Heart rate's a little bit slower throughout the day. 
Um, sleep is a little bit deeper throughout the evening. It just has a ripple effect through a person's physiology. And so you're gonna you're gonna bring peace to your home when you just jump. You're worth friends, my sister. You're worth friends. And thank you for calling. Let me know how this conversation goes if you'll write me back in because people are gonna want to know how this uh, this coffee played out. We'll be right back. Hey, good folks, John Deloney here. I feel like I fell through a glitch in the matrix. This is my job. I get to have this show, do this show, walk alongside each one of you as a career. This is what I do, and I have a blast doing it. And me and the team, we're so thankful for all of you for being a part of our show. Whether you're one of the original 17 or you're one of the millions that's come since then, we are so grateful for you, and we want to put together the best possible show that we can. So if you're one of the originals, or if you're brand new, we want your feedback. Tell us what you love about the show, what you hate about the show, what you'd like to see more of, what you'd like to hear more of, and what you want us to never do again. You can email us at askjohn at ramseysolutions.com. That's askjohn at ramseysolutions.com with your feedback. Thank you for being such an important part of the show. Rock on. All right, we're back. Let's go to Mary in Bakersfield, California. What's up, Mary? <laughs> Hi. What are you How doing? Are you? I'm great. What are you doing? I'm in my car. I'm at work, but I took a little time aside to talk to you. <laughs> That's fantastic. Do you look like a like a phone creeper, like in the car? Are they going to walk by and be like, what's Mary doing? I don't think so. I don't see anybody right now. <laughs> <laughs> good. We have a covert. Okay, good. All right, so what's up? Um, well, when I emailed your, your show, I was talking about... Um, how um, I'm racially mixed. I was born to a, a Mexican mother and a white father. Okay. Um, they couldn't take care of me on their own, so I was uh, put up for adoption at birth. Um, the family that um, took me in uh, as my foster parents, they they adopted me officially at age when I was four, and they're both white, uh, both from Ohio. They don't speak Spanish at all, and what I've noticed is. Since I look Mexican, I've noticed that a lot of uh, Hispanic people expect me to speak Spanish or fit in with the culture somehow, and I don't. Okay. And um, I've never felt comfortable in my own skin about it. Like um, where I work, I work on the east side of town, and it's, uh, I guess, I'd say 90% Spanish speaking. And um, sometimes the reactions I get from people for not speaking Spanish, it's like they think I'm a traitor, or like I, like I um like I'm going against my race, and they obviously they don't know my story. Sure, and it's really honestly it's hurtful. I, I get really hurt by by the the judgment, and um and honestly, I've I've met my my mother's family. I met them about 22 years ago, and I have a, I have a half brother on that side. And um, I, I hear I hear people talk about how Mexican families are so close, but this one isn't, and they're they're just they're backstabby. And I've seen the way they they treated my mother. I never got to meet her; she died before I could meet her. Mm. And I see the way they treated her and, and my brother, and I can see why they weren't there. Yeah. And, and it hurts. Yeah. We can, we can walk through the um, racial and ethnic identity stuff, okay? Yeah. But at the core here, I, I see... How old are you, Mary? Uh, 47. 47. Yeah. I just see a beautiful young woman lost at sea. <laughs> and I see a beautiful young woman lost at sea who doesn't like herself. And I want to ask you... Forget the voices. The voices that are asking you, why did your mom and dad uh, put you up for adoption? Why did you get raised by a white family in Ohio? Why do people in your neighborhood constantly tell you you're not enough, you're too much, whatever? Take those voices aside for a second. That's hard. I know those voices are hard. Mm -hmm. Why don't you like Mary? Um. I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say that I don't like myself. I just don't, I don't like how people treat me. It's usually other Mexicans that treat me this way. Like I'm not Mexican enough and they, they don't, they I know, don't I know, I know. That, but, but 
but the fact that that voice gets into your soul so much. Well, that's the side that rejected me. The Mexican side, they reject my Mexican mother's family did not take me in. If, if it wasn't for my grandparents. There we go. On hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's okay. don't racialize. Let's don't racialize this. Okay. Okay. Your mom's family said they don't want anything to do with you. Mm-hmm. And that hurts. Let's sit on that for a second. Because what I don't want to do is I don't want to take a, a paintbrush and paint the entire Mexican culture. Because mm-hmm. you said Mexican families are supposed to be like X and mine is like mm-hmm. Y. Then what you're doing is you're doing the exact same thing that those people in your community are doing to you. They're looking at you and saying, well, you should be like this. And that's not fair mm-hmm. to do. Let's just look at this family that ch- is choosing actively to not be in your life. We can't run from that. Let's sit in that for a minute because it hurts so mm-hmm. bad. And if we avoid that grief with all this other stuff, the other stuff is real. The ethnic identity and the racial stuff, that's all real. But when we avoid that hurt by this, 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 oh, man. It's heavy. <laughs> and what about your bio's dad's family? Um, I found them through uh, the DNA ancestry. I haven't found my father, but I found his family. Okay. And they, believe it or not, they're, they, most of them live in Arkansas. <laughs> I don't know. Why is that funny? <laughs> uh, well, because it's, it's, a, it's a weird story. I, I haven't found him, but I, I did track down uh, relatives in Arkansas through the DNA test. Okay. Why haven't you reached? Why haven't you reached out to him? I, I can't find him. They they don't know where he is either. And I I, uh, well, okay. I won't get into that. But okay, okay. Um. But anyway, I mean, they've been good about it. I mean, it's and my my mother's family hasn't been all bad, but I've seen the way they treat not only treated my mother when she was alive, mm-hmm. I've seen the way they treat each other. And if it hadn't been for my maternal grandparents, my brother, my, my brother that I mentioned, he probably would have been put in the foster system too. Mm-hmm. By the time I came along, they were too old to take on an infant and nobody else stepped up. My, my mother came from a large family. She was number, number nine out of 10 children mm-hmm. and somebody could have stepped up and taken me and they just didn't. And that, that right there, Mary, that's mm-hmm. where you got to park. I can hear that your voice changes. you you got so much anger there. Yeah. They should have. Yeah. And now, 47-year-old Mary is choosing to cut her life short with high blood pressure and increased heart rate and l- not sleeping and goofed up relationships because you won't put that anger down. They should have shown up and they didn't. And the question you got to ask yourself is, am I going to continue to carry that around like a sack of bricks on my shoulder or am I going to set that crap down? I have a little girl. She's seven. I can't imagine taking a breath of my life without her anymore. And I can't even identify with what you experienced as a kid. I can't. I can't wrap my head around it. Do you have kids of your own? No. Okay. Here's why I think you need to spend some time with, do I like Mary? It's really common for people who have experienced what you've experienced, even though it sounds nuts, there's a five or six or seven-year-old little girl wondering, what is so wrong with me? What did I do? And I want to tell you, you did nothing. Mm Mm-hmm. Your mom and dad, your bio mom and dad had stuff going on in their life that had nothing to do with you. And you got, you were a casualty of it. Mm-hmm. Your extended family on both sides had stuff going on in their life that had nothing to do with you. You were a casualty of it. Mm-hmm. I'm so sorry. Mm-hmm. I grew up, I, I've spent my whole life, except for the last five years, in Texas. And so mm-hmm. I, 
there was a, I think it was in the 80s, maybe 70s or 80s. There was a swath of, so I grew up around Mexican and Hispanic people. That's my, that's mm-hmm. my, that's my life. And um, there was a, a whole movement to not speak Spanish in the home. Mm-hmm. And I've got many friends who are a little bit, who are younger than you, but uh, not by a lot, who's are so just pissed that their parents didn't teach them Spanish, didn't teach mm-hmm. them part of the culture. And it's become yeah. this cool adventure. Not a, you, sh- you should be, not like that. That <laughs> kind of pressure solves no problems, right? It just creates gas, like, 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 uh, like indigestion gas. But yeah. an, an adventure to find out, huh, how far does a string go? Mm-hmm. And you've been on Ancestry, so you've been, you've been digging, right? Yeah, 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 for okay. years. Yeah. So I think once you can start digging, not out of desperation to find out where I come from, but in a spirit of adventure and a spirit of, I want to explore this. Now you got a whole, there's a whole different attitude towards it. And then maybe one, maybe one day, uh, right, let me ask you this. This is a hard question. Mm-hmm. Are you embarrassed that you can't speak Spanish? No, I mean, I've taken Spanish classes and I'm not, I'm I, not I, I good at it. But yeah, I'm but you got to do it in high school. <laughs> Are you embarrassed that you can't speak Spanish? Yes or no? Yes. Why? Well, because it's like, that's why because I'm supposed you... to identify. Well, I mean, I, I would like, I wish I could identify with the Mexican side. I, I wish, I, the thing is growing up, I didn't have that parent to identify with. I didn't have. Like what other eth- uh, ethnically mixed people have, like oh my my mom's family was this, so I used to go to my, you know if I if I, I could have said oh yeah my mom's Mexican and I used to grow up go in my tia's house or on my white side I went to my aunt's house I don't have that I didn't have that growing up so I don't I don't I can't identify with it. Why do you Why are you so mad at Mary for that? Mary didn't I'm do not anything. Mad at Mary, yes you I'm are. Not mad at Mary, I can, yes you are. I can hear it <laughs> when you, when you say. I don't feel like I'm mad at myself. When you're embarrassed that you can't speak Spanish, there's a difference between being embarrassed and wishing I could. My kids know my sister is Tia Loca. Mm -hmm. I wish with all of my heart I was more fluent in Spanish. I could speak a lot more than I actually can. I wish, but I'm not mad at myself for it. Mm -hmm. My wife's taking it right now. She's incredible at it. She just chose one day. I just, this is just dumb. To only know a little bit of Spanish. And we do it for hospitality purpose. We want to be able to speak to people in our community that we hang out with, that are our friends, that we love. And so it's a hospitality thing for us. But it's not a matter of, I should have and I suck and they should have told me. You see, you see the anger and rage you got on this? Mm-hmm. Now imagine you're in algebra class. And there's somebody screaming in your ear. You should know this. You're an idiot. Is that, can you learn under that condition? No. No. Well, then how do I, how, do you think I would be out of, out of line if I, the next person who uh, treats me differently for not speaking Spanish, you think I should tell them, hey, the reason why I don't speak Spanish is because I wasn't raised in a Mexican family. You think that would be too bold? I don't think maybe, it's too bold at all, know, but maybe, I, no, 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 no. Wait, what's it going to solve? Well, I mean, I think they should know. I, sometimes I think they should know, hey, I wasn't raised by a Mexican family. I may be Mexican ethnically, but I wasn't raised by a Mexican family. And so... Will, that make, you wanna, feel, will that make you feel better? I think so. I think, I think, I don't think I should keep it a secret. I, I should be able to talk about it. Or if you just said quietly, I got adopted by a white family. I'm I, I, I don't, I'm getting to the point where I'm starting to, I think people should know, like, you know, I'm sorry. It, I wasn't Here's raised a, in a Spanish-speaking home. I wouldn't apologize for it. Yeah. And I also implore you with all my heart. You got to stop letting all these other voices speak into who you are and what your value is. You don't know these people. Mm -hmm. They're just neighbors clowning on you. Mm -hmm. An exercise that I did once that was awful, that ended up being amazing, was I want you to take a, this is, and I'm passing it along to you. This is your homework assignment. I want you to take a small box. It could be a shoe box or it can be something fancy from a store. I want you to take a small box. 
empty it out and put it on your kitchen table. This is just you. And I want you to take out some note cards, five of them. And I want you to write on the note card the name of a person you are giving permission to speak into your life. What I mean by speak in, they get to tell you, you shouldn't have done that. You just violated your core values. You need to take down that post off social media. That's what people in my box are often telling me. You hurt me. They get to tell you those things. And if they're not in the box, your life practice becomes not caring what other people say. And let me be real honest with you. I've taken my parents out of my bo- that box. I love them. I've got great parents. They don't get a vote on how I raise my kids. They don't get a vote on what I should or shouldn't be doing or what job I should or should be taking. That's not, they don't get a vote on that. My in-laws don't. I love my in-laws. I won the lottery with my in-laws. They don't get a vote. I've got five friends and my wife, maybe six friends and my wife. Those are the people I've given permission. You know who else doesn't have permission? My kids. Because mm-hmm. they're seven and 13. They can't buy beer yet. So they don't get a vote. <laughs> right? Like, it, like, we walk around, especially with social media, we walk around and we let everybody else tell us what we should and shouldn't be doing and feeling and who we should be hating and what skills we should have and what skills we shouldn't have. And that's too Mexican. That's not Mexican enough. Oh, and by the way, when you learn Spanish, you're not going to learn the right accent. You're not, you're right, going right. to, you're going to be a, a white Spanish speaker. Right. I already am. <laughs> I know. And then you're going to be a white Spanish speaker. Like you can't win that game. Right. Right. And, and <laughs> I, I spent a lot of my career studying inside of racial and ethnic diversity. There's colorism within that. Mm-hmm. You're too dark mm-hmm. of a Mexican. You're not, you're too light. You start playing those games and you don't win. And what you're doing is you're taking, you're outsourcing you to everybody else and saying, do I have value? Do I have value? Do I have value? Yeah. And they don't get a freaking vote because you're Mary from Bakersfield. (laughs) And your parents, um, your, your bio lineage, they let you down. And I'm so sorry. But from today forward, as long as you carry that, that is you choosing. I want to wake up and have a more miserable day. I want to wake up and die a little bit younger because I couldn't set that down. And I want, how do I set it down? You have to set it down. You've got to make a choice to set it down. I, it, it can be as simple as this. Once you go to, 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 to home Depot or Lowe's, um, Mm -hmm. and go buy a cinder block, go purchase one. Purchase, actually, you probably need three or four. You've had a rough go. <laughs> and I want you to take a um, cinder block and put duct tape on it. And I want you to write, mi madre. And I want you to mm-hmm. carry that sucker around with you until your arms are so achy and it's so heavy. And to you kink, I can't hold this any longer. And then I want you to take it out in your backyard. And I want you to throw it in the furthest corner and tear the tape off and look at that thing and say, I'm never picking this up again. And what you will have done, it's a tiny little annoying ceremony. Kind of like a funeral, mm-hmm. if you will. You, when you have a funeral, you always know that your loved ones is where they are, where they're buried. Their, their pain, your pain is still in your heart. But you exhale. <laughs> There's a period at the end of that sentence. <sighs> and then at some point, I want you to write a letter to your mom. And ask her all of those questions. What was so bad about me? Mm -hmm. write that letter to your dad. You're not going to send it. This is for you. I want you to write a letter to that 14 year old Mexican girl in a white Ohioan (laughs) home, Ohioan (laughs) home who felt has felt out of place her whole life, just lost at sea and let her know she's amazing. See what I'm saying? Mm Mm-hmm. Your body's been at war since day one. And what I, I, yeah. I, I, I my, my, my prayer for you is peace. Mm-hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you a copy of Own Your Past, Change Your Future, my, my book, okay? I want you to read okay. it start okay. to finish. Thank and um, it's just going to be my gift to you. Will you read it if I send it to you? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
in about a month, if you will practice these things, I want you to call me back and I'll even have you back on the show. And listen, okay. if, if I have you back and you're like, oh, I did all these things that you said and you're stupid. I will. You can tell the world this guy's a fraud. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But if you'll do those things and you'll keep a journal of all of your negative self-talk, the shoulds, I got tos, I have tos. No, I don't. I'm freaking Mary from Bakersfield. I'm worth being loved. And this person who I don't know, who just stopped me in, in line at a grocery store and said something to me in Spanish, and I responded back, no hable espanol, and they made a face at me. <laughs> I don't even know who they are. I'm not going to let them ruin my day. I don't even know them. I'm going to go on about my day because I'm married from Bakersfield. And my life is good. My life is good. Choose peace, Mary. Thank you so much for being brave and thank you for the call. We'll be right back. Hey, what's up? Now that my new book, Own Your Past, Change Your Future is out in the wild, we've been hearing reviews and feedback from readers and wow, I'm so grateful. And one of the things I've been most excited about hearing is that this book is not just for people who are healing from terrible traumatic experience or other big scary things from their past. This book is for everyone in every walk of life. The single 30-year-old looking to sharpen their mind, the 25-year-old hoping to make new friends, the parent who's tired of seeing their kid's eyes glued to a screen, but who doesn't know how to re-enter their life. People coming out of abusive relationships, everyone. And this book isn't me talking at you. This book is me walking with you, because I've been there too. To better understand and improve your mental, relational, and emotional health, please check out Own Your Past, Change Your Future at johndeloney.com today. That's johndeloney.com today. All right, we are back. Listen, we've had more and more people call in this year who are struggling with issues and drama and mayhem in the workplace. Since 2021, we've seen 4 million people a month leave their jobs. Political economist Nicholas Eberstadt tells us that there are 7 million million able-bodied men opting to sit at home collecting government handouts instead of working. I think there's more who have just opted out of the system completely. They're just done. They just, they just closed the laptop and went home. So why are people giving up on work? There's a drift to mediocrity plaguing our culture because people aren't finding meaning in their work anymore. Decades of bad leadership in corporate America, um, decreased engagement at work, quiet quitting, the great resignation. And let's be honest, man, I got buddies who are, are, have great jobs. They've got great jobs and they love their jobs and they can't afford rent and groceries in the same city. It's just a weird mess. Productivity is down. Complacency is at an all time high. And some of you are listening might be stuck in the middle of it all right now. And this is, this is a nonpartisan th- event because I've got friends on both sides of the aisle who are just about done with it. On May 4th, I'm teaming up with Dave Ramsey, Ken Coleman, Mike Rowe of Dirty Jobs, Michael Easter, um, who's the author of one of my favorite books of the last decade, Comfort Crisis. Um, We're going to be talking about the state of work in America today. We're going to address the labor crisis and give business leaders solutions for how to find and hire the right people in this madness. And here's the deal. If you're not a leader and you're not a boss, this this is like getting backstage behind the curtain and listening to how bosses talk to other bosses. So you're going to get a playbook on what people are looking for, what they are desperate to have on, who they're desperate to have on their teams. And here's the best part of this. The whole thing's free. The whole thing is free. If you're a business leader, small business owner, or you just want to figure out what you're doing with your career, you got to move. It's time. You want to do something different, whatever it is. If you are struggling right now, you don't want to miss this free live stream. You can register by visiting RamseySolutions.com slash labor crisis. All right. And so as we wrap up, usually we do lyrics at the end of the day. We're, we're, we're not doing that today. We're doing something new. This brought me so much joy that we decided instead of doing lyrics, I'm just going to make you make you smile before the day's over. It's from CBS. CBS feels like, <laughs> never mind. It's from CBS Evening News. Teenagers help seniors learn how to use technology and they form friendships along the way. Residents at Brookdale Senior Living have a wealth of wisdom, but there are some gaps in that knowledge. Most notably, how do I turn on my cell phone? 
Everything from turning on devices to receiving emails, connecting families to finding relevant applications posed um, trouble for the residents. So students um, at Canterbury School in Fort Myers, Florida, were joking about it. These are high school kids about how bad their grandparents were at tech. And then when the laughter faded, a, guy, a young man named Aaron said, I have an idea. He got his friends together and they started the computers, computer literacy education outreach program. They partnered with Brookdale. So they just showed up. They walked over there and they started connecting with these folks. Wisdom's being shared. Relationships are being formed. Y'all know I'm not a fan of technology, but when it's used right, it can be magic. And these young men and women are, are, are changing lives. And here's the secret. Those folks at the uh, senior living home are changing lives too. They're passing that wisdom back down the system. What a rad idea. Don't tell me, I don't know what to do. Get on the phone and go find some people who are in need and just show up. I love you guys. We'll see you soon.